weeks ago, we were talking about a hole in the roof. And that is the story that is immediately preceding the text for today, where we saw Jesus declaring forgiveness and then demonstrating that truth with healing. So this morning, let's see how Jesus lives out that very same forgiveness by reaching out to those considered on the outside of respectability and then seeing how we might live out that message in our lives. So listen to God's word to you as we're again in Mark's gospel as we'll be for the next several weeks. I appreciated one of the members on the retreat saying how much she enjoyed reading right through Mark's gospel, which is how it was meant to be read. And I encourage you to do the same as we stay in this gospel for a couple of weeks. Listen to God's word to you. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me. That's what Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with them and his, with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we read this short passage in Scripture, which we've probably read before, this calling of Levi. But what is it that you would have us understand better and to see in a new way that might influence our behavior to imitate Jesus? May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. So I'm going to make an assumption that uh, the vast majority of you took part in that national tradition that we have of watching the Super Bowl, right? And then also, many of you took it upon yourselves, as I intimated last week, to be a part of the rating scale of what sometimes turns out to be even more exciting, and that's the commercials. We were a little disappointed this year, weren't we? Not quite the same flair that they've had for a couple of years, but they did cost more. $4.5 million for 30 seconds. That's serious business in advertising, isn't it? So the ratings came out. I looked to see which was number one. And it depends on what rating that you looked at, but the number one rating had a cute little puppy, right? The lost puppy, did y'all like that one? Of course, you know who it was for, right? <laughs> Budweiser, that's right. We just want to keep the level playing field here. And so then there was another one that I thought was pretty good, and that was the, it's on the rankings in the top three, and that was a hashtag like a girl. Did you remember that one? Throw like a girl, play like a girl. I mean, that was an interesting statement of overcoming a stigma. And then the third one was another sentimental one, and that was our good friends with the yellow arches, pain with loving. Did you see that one where you'll, uh, they'll pick out someone and you will get a free meal if you tell who you love? Like, I love my mother, and Howard, I love my mother. I mean, yes, okay. <laughs> he said yes. He loved, yeah. Uh, yeah there, there you go. That's worth a hamburger right there. <laughs> Look at that. You guys are special. So the one I liked best, though, what well, didn't, didn't reach the top 10. And it's one of the car commercials. So you tell me which one it was. No, no, don't, don't guess. Now I haven't told you yet. Yeah. <laughs> 
not the one you work for here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you start out with these centenarians. All right, the centenarians telling the world what they've learned in their hundred years. And they start out somewhat sentimentally. There are miracles all around you. Stay young. Always tell the truth. Keep your eyes open and sometimes your mouth shut. <laughs> and then ending with a certain centenarian panache, hesitate and you lose. Put the pedal to the metal. Live fast. Never ever forget where you came from. And then you see the car swooping in on the, on the sand. Anyone know which commercial? What company? Dodge. A Dodge Challenger with love and, and it has a centenarian driving it, spinning those wheels. And then it has in the caption, you learn a lot in 100 years. Because Dodge started in 2014. Com See it if you're listening. Good job, Donna. I, got, I heard you. Uh, thank you. 1914. Okay. It's 100 years among friends, right? Okay. So the commercial's purpose is to share a message that will influence our behavior. They want us to go out and buy the product. But that's the purpose of a commercial. Give a message that will make a change. Mark's text is doing the very same thing. Share a message of how Jesus acts and then see if it will influence our behavior. So the church can say, like Dodge, you can learn a lot in 2,000 years. So let's see what we can learn from the story of Levi. Now on the surface, the most obvious interpretation is that about discipleship. Jesus says, follow me, and Levi immediately reacts. Now the last time Jesus was near the sea, this is the Sea of Galilee, he called four fishermen to follow him. Now he is right there at the similar spot, somewhere probably near Capernaum, but this time he calls another person to follow him. And it's a tax collector, not a fisherman. Now this would make a very good three-point relational discipleship sermon. First point is that Jesus comes to you. The second point is that you react and you get up and follow Jesus. And the third point is that you, with thanksgiving in your heart, not only invite Jesus into your heart and into your home, but you go and invite all your friends at the office to come also with you to your home and have dinner together. Now that would be the whole message. Short, right to the point, end of story, let's get out early. Do I hear an amen? Not all of you need to say amen. <laughs> and besides, there's more to the story. There's a little bit more that we can learn from this passage. And particularly if we look at it from a different perspective. But it's a lot more complicated and a lot more challenging. So instead of looking at it as a discipleship message, we could focus on it as an evangelical message. The interpretation then has much more to do with what we learn from Jesus about breaking down barriers and opening ourselves and the church as a whole to people who are not like us. I told you it's more complicated and more challenging. And there's a clue, I think, in Mark as to how you could see it this way. 
If you read one chapter further in chapter 3, when Jesus invites all 12 disciples to follow him, Mark lists them by name, and Levi is not on the list. Now, Matthew is on the list, and some people will say that Matthew and Levi are the same person. But Mark just called him Levi in chapter 2. And there's no Levi in chapter 3. Could be a different person. At the very least, it should get us thinking that perhaps the call to follow Jesus is not limited to those people we know, the inner circle, the community of believers, but must be open to all people, even the most recognizable of sinners. Sin. It reminds me of a story that in a church a long time ago, I was giving a seven-part series of sermons on the deadly sins, the seven deadly sins. And toward the end of that series, after one particular sermon, I was in, like, the narthex. And one of those almost centenarian matriarchs of the church came up to me and said something like this. You know, Pastor, we never really knew what sin was until you came. <laughs> you know, I'm going to take that as a compliment, but you had to be there, right? Sin. We've heard the word so many times, it's almost a cliche. We don't like to hear the word. We don't like to use the word outside of church. And we don't even really know what the word actually means. And if you saw, but at the time of Jesus, all those righteous, good people knew exactly what it means. If you saw someone coming up the street who was a sinner, First of all, how do you know they're a sinner from afar? You only had two choices as a righteous person living at that time. One was, do not look at them. Especially, you wouldn't look at them eye to eye. And the second option is to just turn around. Just turn around and go the other way. Not only did religious people of that day want to stay ceremoniously clean, by not interacting with sinners. But they certainly didn't want to be seen in the company of sinners. They didn't want other people to think that they might be sinners by, you know, association. So that when you look at our text from this evangelical angle, you see that Jesus did his very best to change this blatant, exclusive attitude. Yes, he wanted to show people God doesn't approve of sin and said such things as go and sin no more. But just as important, Jesus wanted to show that God cares about sinners. And so should we with the kind of language hate the sin but love the sinner. So one day, as Jesus was walking along up near Capernaum, an area which he was very familiar, he walks by this tax collector's booth, and he sees Levi, and he gives him two words, follow me. That's all it took, because the next thing we read is, and Levi got up and followed him. Now back then, tax collectors weren't liked at all. Well, some things haven't changed in 2,000 years. <laughs> the system was so corrupt. Rome provided a soldier for tax collectors as a bodyguard and to ensure that payment was made, both above the table and under the table. In the days of Jesus, most people thought that working as a tax collector and being a sinner were synonymous. 
But as we often find in Scripture, this story goes deeper than just the person of Levi. What we find out is that once Jesus broke through that cultural barrier and he reached out to Levi, all of a sudden, a whole flock of tax collectors gathered around and wanted to see what Jesus was all about. You see, you might miss it at first reading. It's right there in verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. Never before had anyone so good or so holy ever bothered to sit down and talk with those kinds of people. The rest of the religious people simply labeled all tax collectors as sinful and evil people to be shunned whenever possible. But Jesus set aside those kinds of labels. Instead, he saw those tax collectors as people, people who also needed to know how much God loved them. From this perspective, it makes us wonder, are there any limits to the welcome of God in Jesus? Are there any limits? When we read that Jesus was in trouble with the religious authorities, it's not just because he ate with and he welcomed those kinds of people who were unwelcome by the religious people of the day. He was in trouble because he made it unequivocally clear God's welcome was as equally wide. To put it another way, there was no one not welcome to be with Jesus. No one. We see this throughout the Gospels, this, that Jesus' inclusive ministry cut across all social boundaries as he reached out to the Jews and Gentiles, men and women, poor and affluent, the religious and the sinners. That's the message of this morning's text. Seeing how Jesus lives out his message of forgiveness and reaches out to the social and religious outsiders. But you remember when we first started, I said that this text is like a commercial. And Mark wants to share the message and how Jesus acts. And then he wants to see if this message will influence our behavior to be more like Jesus. Now I've been inspired this week, past week, as I was thinking about this message, with two very different stories along this line. One of them is, was on YouTube that one of you sent me. I get a lot of emails from, from you. And um, it was of a YouTube of some German students and a homeless man. In fact, don't think we have it up there, Mark, do we, John? It's not for this service. It's being shown in the next service. And I'll, I'll tell real quickly. It's um, a homeless man sitting down, and a young German fellow comes and asks if he can borrow his bucket. He's got a big, you know, like a little one-gallon bucket there. And uh, he wants to play some music on it. He sits down with him, converses with him for a minute, sits down with him. The man has a little tiny um, container for some coins in it. It's along a big mall kind of a street. And he starts banging on the bucket. And then another friend of... The young German man sits down and starts playing a violin, and another one comes in and starts playing a different instrument, and pretty soon, they got a crowd there. And pretty soon, the crowd starts giving money. And then afterwards, when it's over, the man gives the, the young German boy, gives the homeless man all of the money, shakes his hand, and goes on his way. 
And it reminded me of um, last week at the offertory, John, John Hershey, when you said how you were encouraging us to give, not with any expectation to give anything back, just for the joy of giving. I'll tell you another thing that I saw this week, and it came out in the um, major news, you probably saw it too, that the Vatican Church is going to start, uh, at the Vatican, they're going to start providing haircuts and a shave and a place for a shower for homeless in Rome. And that really impressed me to hear of what they're going to do for those who are so needy. But what really caught my eye and impressed me was the way it came about. That Bishop Conrad Krajewski, who is the Pope's almoner, which when you translate that in Protestant language, that means he's chair of the Pope's charity committee. The bishop was having lunch with a homeless man. And the homeless man told the bishop how it's pretty easy to get food, as people in need can, and the places to do that in Rome, but how there was nowhere to get clean, to, to shave, to get fresh underwear, to get clothes, and to be respectable to regain your dignity. You know how difficult it would be. I doubt many of us have been there. To keep your dignity in the stench and smell of dirtiness and soured clothes. So it really impressed me that Bishop Krajewski met with this man and changed their behavior to meet the need. How many times do you put bishop and homeless in the same sentence? How many times do you put minister and marginalized in that sentence? How many times do you put church member and nuns in the same sentence? N-O-N-E-S, no church affiliation. None. Paul tells the Corinthian church, as church members, they are the greatest witness for Christ's cause. He says, you are the letter Christ is writing to the world. Now in today's language, it's like saying, he's talking to the Corinthians church, I'll talk to you, you Highland, as church members, are the advertisement, the million dollar commercial for all the world to see. Wow. You mean if the world wants to know more about the message of Christ, they just need look at us? That's serious business. You Highland members, are Christ's letter of recommendation, Paul says. You are the only sermon some people will ever hear. You are the only gospel some folk will ever read. You are the best advertisement Christ has to reach out to others. So Highland, let's improve our commercial rating this year. Let's make our message so convincing that all viewers will see just how much we love God. Let's creatively advertise for all to see how our behavior is influenced by the very message as we reach out and invite others to follow Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, it's not what's in your wallet that we ask, but what's in our hearts. Amen.